Hey everyone, it's Jim with the Easy Seating Systems. I'm here today with Anna Kilborn to talk a little bit about something you hear people complain a lot about. And it doesn't really matter where you go, whether you're around friends or family or even strangers. Uh, it seems like you always encounter people who are grabbing their low backs or their hips or their buttock and lower legs and saying, oh, man, it just feels like that sciatic pain's kicking in. And it's funny because we were just talking before kicking off this podcast. Um, although it's a common complaint, I'm kind of getting the gist that a lot of times what people are experiencing actually isn't sciatica and it's not as common as you'd think. So we want to chat a little bit today and try to crack some of those myths. Um, but before we really get in depth, um, I always like to have my guests kind of introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their experience. So Anna, if you could just kind of give us a little background, we'd appreciate it. No problem, Jim. Um, so I'm Anna, uh, Dr. Anna Kilborn. I'm a physical therapist. And I got my doctorate degree in physical therapy in 2013. I have been primarily working in kind of outpatient sports medicine, orthopedic environments, which basically means I'm the person that you would come to see if your back hurts uh, <laughs> on like a regular basis. Um, I also have sort of a special certification, which is called an orthopedic clinical specialist. And in the PT world, this is just something that you can get by taking a very, very difficult exam uh, to kind of get certified. And then there's kind of requirements to maintain. So it just means that I've really focused my education in the orthopedic world of physical therapy. Okay. And just to explain a little bit more about orthopedics for us. Yeah. Um, orthopedics basically means the study of the bones and the muscles. So that's in contrast to maybe someone that works on your heart and lungs, which would be cardiopulmonary or your nervous system, which would be neurology. So kind of my specialty is what are the muscles and bones doing and kind of how can we use that knowledge to help people feel better? Gotcha. So very relevant to sciatica. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess if you want to start, really, what is it and what's going on? And, you know, if somebody has it, why are they in pain? All right. So hang tight for a little bit of an overview of anatomy, and I will try not to get overly technical on you all. Okay. Um, you've probably seen a picture of a spine before, and you can see there's a bunch of little building blocks that kind of stack up to make up your spine. And each of those is called a vertebra. Um, the bottom vertebrae, they are called the lumbar spine. We have to have a fancy Latin word for everything in the medical world. Um, and that's the one they decided on. Um, so in between each of those little bones, um, there's a little nerve that sticks out and we call that the nerve root because it's the beginning of the nerve. So sciatica is related to inflammation of the sciatic nerve itself. And that nerve comes from multiple levels. Okay. They get named for the, the number of where they're at. Mm -hmm. And it comes from the bottom two of the, that lower back section, the lumbar section. And then it comes from the top two of the little kind of triangle bone below that, which is called your sacrum. All of those nerves together become the sciatic nerve, okay? And that goes kind of down your leg, and it gets splits into some other nerves down there, and it, it kind of gets different names. But when we talk about sciatica, we're, we're really thinking specifically about that nerve and how it's behaving. So I've heard you talk a little bit about how the term sciatica has been generalized. If you want to discuss a little more on that. Yeah. Um, like you said earlier, I think a lot of people have heard of sciatica. They kind of know that it's kind of in, in that region. Um, and sometimes it'll get used as kind of like any kind of pain in the 
back, buttock, leg area at all. Mm -hmm. um, we'll just sort of kind of call it all sciatica, um, which is technically kind of inaccurate because it should be specifically to, to those specific nerves and that nerve being involved. Um, so we have a, a longer, fancier word for kind of nerve pain in the leg in general, and that's radiculopathy. Um, and sciatica is just a very specific type. And if you're like, I don't know, my leg just hurts, uh, that's fine. It's not really your job to figure it out. Your healthcare provider can help you kind of get the correct terminology. It just helps us um, kind of be more specific with our treatment okay. um, if we know kind of exactly where the problem is. Gotcha. I just got a question too. Like when you would, when you're in the clinic, do you get a lot of times just a general referral where it says sciatica, where it actually your job to kind of figure out if it is or not? Yeah, we get, we get a fair amount of that. We also get a lot of referrals that just say back pain okay. um, or leg pain, um, which is very vague. And I don't really mind. I like the process of sort of figuring it out. Um, that's sort of part of our, our job as a, a good practitioner. Um, but we do get a lot of like very, very vague referrals. Okay. <laughs> so you said with sciatica, the nerves get irritated. What are, how are some of the ways they get irritated? Like what's going on? Uh, typically a nerve can get irritated in a few different ways. So um, they don't like being squished. So any kind of compression, squeezing, they're not going to like that. They don't like being stretched too far. So pulling um, on the nerve and anything that causes inflammation. Um, and then also if there's not good blood flow to the area, that can be a problem. So then the next question probably I know you're going to ask me is, uh, how does that happen? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it can happen in a, in a couple of different ways. There are a few different conditions that can kind of lead to sciatica or sciatic nerve symptoms. Uh, most commonly, a lot of people have heard of a disc herniation or a disc bulge. Um, so the disc is the tissue that lives in between the vertebra. It's like a little cushion. Okay. Um, and that can sometimes get a little displaced and push on the nerve. Um, you can also have a bone spur, which is little extra bone growing. That could be from arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, and that can push on the nerve. So we talked about compression being one of the things that can be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the actual uh, sort of space where the the... the um, either the spinal cord itself or the little hole that the nerve root comes out of, mm -hmm. it's smaller. And that's called stenosis. Okay. Okay. Um, and then it could be a trauma, you know, maybe a direct trauma, a fall, something that kind of just impacted that nerve um, directly. There could be muscles that are kind of putting pressure on the nerve. Um and then we have kind of some more serious but less common conditions. Okay, so the, all those ones we just said are mm -hmm. probably more uh, common, but less commonly we might see things like a tumor, which could be cancerous or could be benign, that would um, take up some space and not have as much space left for the nerve, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've got something called spondylolisthesis, which is basically just that the the vertebrae, instead of staying stacked on top of each other, maybe one is kind of sliding hmm. backwards. That can come from a fracture or an injury. Um, it's a kind of like a, a very specific condition. Um, and then something we always kind of watch out for when we're talking about sciatica is called cauda equina syndrome, which is a, it's a condition where the nerve is so compressed that um, there is like kind of more serious stuff going on wow. in, ter in terms of like kind of loss of nervous function. Wow. So of those possible conditions that can cause it, have you, do you know, is there a, is there a certain one that is more likely to cause it? The sciatic problems, like in your experience or 
It's just kind I of a mixed bag. I don't have the, um, you know, the, like, exact numbers at the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, but most commonly what we see in the clinic is the stenosis, where there's just not enough space anymore because okay. the bone is growing, or the disc bulge, disc herniation, where the disc is in the way. Those are kind of the two, and probably the arthritis will be the third. So we okay. don't see that often, these other things, but we just have to kind of know, like if I'm seeing mm -hmm. you and you came to me with that really vague diagnosis of leg pain, I want to make sure it's not a tumor before I treat you. So sure. we're missing something important. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that makes sense. When it comes to sciatica, are there, I'm sure there's plenty of risk factors out there. Um, could you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. Some of the risk factors for sciatica are sort of the normal things that we hear all the time that are risk factors for a lot of different conditions. Mm -hmm. So smoking, obesity, mental stress, physical stress, sedentary lifestyle, and diabetes. We hear kind of across the board for a lot of different things mm -hmm. um, that those are problematic. Um, a couple other things that are kind of interesting about sciatica um, the most common onset, depending on whose numbers you look at, is either between like 30 and 60 or 45 and 65. Um, so it's not something that usually affects very young or very old folks. It's kind of um, right in the middle. Okay. Um, and there is some indication that being very tall may also increase sort of the stress on the spine. Okay. Um, an increased risk for sciatica. Gotcha. I think it's kind of interesting that you say um, people who either sit or are very sedentary or very active, it's it's like there's not even a fine line that divides it. It's like you could be two opposite ends of the spectrum and and still experience it. So Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I think we see that for a lot of conditions where like your body responds well to an intermediate amount of load and so not enough and it doesn't do well and too much and it also doesn't do well um they have very different kind of paths to becoming uh, a problem but definitely interesting sure yeah so how is it diagnosed like you said a lot of people will come to a physical therapist um with sort of this vague problem back pain leg pain not sure what's going on. Um, uh, we would do a clinical diagnosis through a kind of deep dive into your your history, your information, um, and a clinical exam. So there's a, a very long conversation that we have, and I think patients aren't always expecting that. We want to talk to you for like at least 10 minutes before we sure. start doing anything. Um, what makes it better? What makes it worse? Uh, how did it start? When did it start? Those questions help us figure out what pattern it best fits into. So you can imagine I've got like a bunch of templates in my brain and I'm trying to match my patient to the correct one. And then we're going to go through and do some physical tests to kind of confirm that diagnosis that I suspect. So if I suspect someone has sciatica, I'm looking for things like changes in the way they feel in their leg. So changes mm -hmm. to your sensation, uh, maybe a numb spot, something like that. And those kind of occur in really specific patterns that we're going to look for. Changes in the reflexes. So we, we check reflexes in the leg um, and changes in the strength of the leg. Um, looking for sort of this specific kind of weakness that occurs when the nerves are um, not giving the right signals to the muscle. Okay. okay. And then we do some like really specific tests that they've done studies on that kind of show us like, yes, yeah, this, this confirms probably, uh, sciatica or, or like, oh, if that test's negative, then we really kind of, kind of don't think it is. So one of the really common ones is that you'll lay on your back and the PT will uh, lift your leg up and kind of bend your foot back. And if the nerve is inflamed, it will, it's a pain pain provocation test, it will hurt. <laughs> no, they'll know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really pretty, pretty obvious. Um, it's, it's usually not like a, oh, I'm not sure. 
Um, I do get a lot of people tell me they feel stretched in their hamstrings. That's normal. Mm. So don't worry about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, is there a certain motion that you'll see weakness in? It depends on which of those little nerve roots are affected. So okay. each muscle has um, a kind of specific nerve or number of nerve roots that are or associated with it. Okay. Um, and so we'll test each one of those and, and, um, you know, I, everyone has their own method. I do mine in like a very specific pattern. I do it the same way every time <laughs> helps me keep track of what's going on. Um, and so depending on where the weakness is that can help us figure out what nerves are, are problematic. Okay. So you talked a little bit about the PT clinical diagnosis and what you do. How about from other perspectives like the medical side from a doctor or whatnot? The the doctor can do some more in-depth testing that we don't necessarily have access to um, in the PT clinic. So they might order some imaging like x-ray, an MRI, a CT scan, or an EMG, which is testing how well the nerves are giving signals down into the leg. Um, sometimes they're looking to figure out what the cause of the sciatica is. Um, you know, they're looking to see, is there bony overgrowth? Is there a disc problem? Why is this happening? Um, sometimes for a more accurate diagnosis, the physician will order a nerve block injection. Um, so what they're doing is they're numbing the nerve to temporarily uh, kind of stop it from um, working and, and sensing. And so if they do that injection and the pain goes away, then they're pretty confident that that was the place where the problem is occurring. So moving on, um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the misconceptions. Um, as we were talking about earlier, there must be several out there. Um, the first question, is it a condition, a diagnosis, or a symptom? Kind of a tough question. Uh, I think personally, I would call it a condition because there is another diagnosis. There is another issue um, that is leading to the sciatica. So sciatica doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs as a result of some other kind of diagnosis. Um, when we put our kind of codes in, in the medical world, we have to kind of document everything. Mm -hmm. We code your, your condition as um, back pain that does or does not have sciatica. So it's kind of associated with the diagnosis, but it's not okay. a diagnosis in itself. Okay. And like I mentioned earlier, you hear a lot of people talk about, I have sciatica. Is it really that common? It's fairly common. Um, you know, back pain is fairly common in our society. And about a third of people who have back pain will have sciatic symptoms. Um, but as we kind of talked about earlier, it also tends to kind of get overused as kind of a grab bag of like, you have some kind of pain in your leg or um, I know I have a lot of patients who like they know where the sciatic nerve like is. So they'll be like, it hurts right here. It's sciatica. And I'm like, well, there's a lot of things that could hurt right there. So why don't we find out? <laughs> um, so like it is common, but it's also maybe like not every person that tells you they have sciatica actually does. Yeah. <laughs> And I kind of know what your answer is going to be, but let's say somebody's still thinking this. If I have leg or back pain, I have sciatica. Yeah, I mean, and it's definitely possible because it is fairly common. But it's always worth seeing, you know, either your, your physician, your physical therapist, um, a physiatrist, uh, someone who specializes in orthopedics and mm -hmm. study of the muscles and the bones. Um, to kind of figure out really why do you have that? Um, it's hard to self-diagnose and there's a lot of other things that could be causing similar, um, symptoms. So, uh, don't be afraid to consult an expert. Gotcha. Uh, how about this one? It's caused by a specific event. Yeah. And that's kind 
of an interesting uh, question and something I think in the medical world that we kind of talk a lot about and, and, and discuss and debate. So it definitely can be, you know, there's, um, you know, trauma, um, slip and falls. Mm-hmm. Um, other times there is sort of uh, what I would call repetitive micro trauma. So just like lots of little irritations over time that finally mm-hmm. reaches a point where your body's like, no, I don't mm-hmm. want to deal with that anymore. Um, and some people, you know, will talk about like, oh, I, I lifted this box and my back went out. I shut the car door and my back went out. And, you know, it, it onsets kind of suddenly. But usually there's been some kind of like ongoing ir- irritation or issue before that that mm-hmm. just all of a sudden kind of reached that final straw where your body was over threshold and you, and you get the pain. Um, though there can be traumatic injuries from, from things like lifting. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear that it was something really light, like that the patient would lift all the time. Hmm. And they're surprised because they're like, I just picked up a piece of paper or a shoe or whatever. Um, and so that's when I start to think, well, there was probably something going yeah. on beforehand. So it can be just where somebody made one wrong move and that's kind of what's set off the gradual progression of the condition or however you want to say it. Yeah. I mean, there there probably was some kind of uh, things happening before that. And you think about things like disc problems or that stenosis that are the most common. Um, mm. Bones don't grow very suddenly. <laughs> Um, and most, uh, disc herniations, you know, they, they bulge a little bit and they bulge a little bit more and they, they don't go from like your disc is fine to like it's ruptured all at once. Um, so a lot of things are, are probably already kind of set up and then there's just some of an incident that kind of tips it over the edge. Gotcha. How about this one? I feel like I hear this one a lot. So I think I may have it. And the best thing I should do is just rest, stay in bed, uh, avoid physical activity. Mm -mm. No, I think um, (laughs) years ago, like maybe 20 years ago, uh, that bed rest was like the the sort of recommended treatment for um, for sciatica and for back pain. And uh, we're finding more and more that that is just not a good idea unless you like are really in so much pain that you actually can't move. um, Usually gentle activity is going to be better. Um, So, you know, you have that maybe you have this kind of sudden onset that feels pretty bad. Um, You want to take a couple days of what I would call relative rest. So, Mm not doing a lot of lifting, twisting, carrying, you know, kind of stuff, but you don't need to stay in bed all day. It usually does not make people feel better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could, I could imagine actually lying in bed that long, having it contribute to more pain. Yeah. Some people definitely feel worse. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember when I was in the clinic, we always had the saying to people, use it or lose it. So I could, see where this would apply (laughs) right and it's always kind of tough because you definitely have um like i think a lot of us fall into one of two categories we're either like oh my god i'm super injured and i'm gonna lay in bed all day or we're like i'm fine and i'm gonna continue to do all my really intense workouts and weightlifting and running and going to work and like something in the middle (laughs) is usually the best path (laughs) (laughs) that's usually how it goes yeah (laughs) Ah, uh, so how about this? I thinking I have it. I'm probably going to need pain medication. Definitely worth talking to your physician about. Um, some, depending on the severity and the symptoms, some physicians will prescribe some anti-inflammatories, especially early in the process. Um, but more and more, we're finding um, that. Uh, opioids are unnecessary for the treatment of back pain and sciatica. Um, A lot of the research, so um, kind of what they do in the research world is they compile all these studies into one mega study. um, That's called a systematic review. 
And those studies are basically saying there's not a lot of evidence that opioids really help. Um, and now, you know, we're learning more and more about the side effects and potential negative impacts. It just doesn't seem worth it to me. It wouldn't be my first recommendation. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously you want to talk to your physician, um, since they're, they're the one that knows, you know, the medical history and what's appropriate for each, each person. Gotcha. Okay. So let's say I have pain and I think it might be sciatica. Uh, what steps should I take? Uh, should I immediately go to a doctor? Should I seek out help from a physical therapist? What's my best course of action? I think the first thing that's really important to recognize is whether or not uh, there are any um, kind of really severe symptoms that we would we would call in our world red flags. So mm -hmm. indications that something maybe emergent is going on that's more than sciatica. So we talked a little bit earlier about uh, cauda equina syndrome. Um, which is this kind of severe nerve compression, um, things mm -hmm. like that. So if you are experiencing really severe pain, maybe over 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, um, any changes to like bowel or bladder issues, especially incontinence, especially if you were not incontinent before, that's pretty serious. Um, and what we call saddle anesthesia. So Numbness in the area where if you were like sitting on a saddle that mm -hmm. would be touching the saddle, we'll ask patients, does it feel funny when you wipe? That could be kind of a, a big, okay. bigger concern of some like really important nerve loss. Mm -hmm. um, and um, any kind of like, I can't walk, I'm stumbling, uncoordinated. Um, those are all kind of like, you might want to see a doctor very urgently or even like go to urgent care, ER, if it's really bad um, mm -hmm. kind of issues. Um, without those things, it becomes like less emergent. And we do have patients who seek um, emergent care for like regular back pain, uh, especially if they don't have good primary care. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's good to sort of know like what's urgent and what's not urgent, you know. Um, for everyone else, you can kind of imagine, like, I, I think of it as sort of like a funnel. Um, a lot of people with that relative rest, um, maybe anti-inflammatories, maybe a, a cold pack, a hot pack, some like gentle motion, go for a walk. A lot of people feel better in a week or two, um, sometimes even a couple days. Um, so if it's improving, you know, you might not decide you need to seek treatment at all. Um, most people get better. Um, about 30% of people tend to have prolonged symptoms. So if it's not getting better, you definitely want to see a medical professional. Okay. Um, my next line of defense would probably be physical therapy. I'm a physical therapist, so I'm a little bit biased. <laughs> um, that would be my choice and what I'd recommend. Uh, some states are going to require that you see your physician first mm -hmm. um, because they have to prescribe the physical therapy, whereas like other states, you can go straight to a PT. So if you have a, yeah. a PT that you like, you could call them and ask, like, do you need a prescription or can I just come by, have this <laughs> back pain? I'd love to be seen, you know, like tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times they'll help you out. Uh, so... Um, PT is pretty effective for these conditions. We see a lot of people get a lot better, um, you know, and if it's not improving with PT, you know, in, in a month or two, we're going to send it back to the physician and kind of say like, it's not really working. We need more information. <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And that's when we look at considering getting more testing. So I know a lot of, a lot of people, like, they really want to know, like, what's going on in there. And they want, like, the MRI, the X-ray right away. It's really probably unnecessary for most people, especially if you're improving. Um, so that really might happen later, you know, if they're not seeing progress. Your physician might order yeah. that. Um, or they might order an injection or 
or try some medications. Um, I'd say like the more severe the case, the earlier I'm going to send them to a physician. Whereas mm-hmm. like a, a mild case, you know, it, it's more likely that they would be treated with PT alone. Okay. So let's say somebody's going to go into their or go seek therapy uh, services to manage sciatica. Um, what's kind of the what does the process kind of look like from start more or less to finish? So on the first day, um, there's going to be a lot of talking and a lot of testing and and probably mm-hmm. not that much treatment. Um, so we want to figure out what's driving the problem, what's kind of going on um, that's irritating and causing symptoms. And then we also want to figure out what treatment methodology kind of system would you be most likely to feel better with and respond to. Um, So we have kind of like kind of categories. There are some people that feel better with forward bending, some people that feel better with backwards bending, some people feel better with strengthening. And so um, that evaluation process is sort of figuring out um, like where are we going to start? What do we think is going to be the best process for you as an individual? Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, determining like the plan. How often do you need to be seen? How long do we think it'll take? And then on average, how long is the treatment? Like how long does it go for? Um. So individual, like a session, it just depends on the therapist, maybe half, mm-hmm. half an hour to, I don't know, 90 minutes at most. That seems like probably a lot. So maybe 30 to 60 minutes. Okay. Um, and um, in that time, you know, you might do a variety of different things. So most of the time you'll do some kind of warm up, improve the blood flow, um, some kind of... Uh, you know, pain management driven exercises, is it stretching, mobility work, strengthening, whatever we decided earlier was mm-hmm. going to work for that patient. Um, some hands-on treatment. So we might, you know, help some uh, muscles or some joints move better to relieve um, some of the stress. Um, and most of the time, a whole lot of education and discussion and behavioral modification. So helping you figure out how to treat yourself, uh, which is way more important um, than, you know, coming Mm. in and having like sort of this passive care um, patients who are really involved in their own care tend to get better faster. Sure. And I could imagine part of that education process is helping the patient become more aware of some of the motions that really could aggravate it and how to how to change it sometimes it's it amazes me just uh how simple some of the changes can be and i i don't know if it's sometimes we're just in a hurry and we do things awkwardly or or what but sometimes it's just the, like like i said just the simplest modifications and you've done yourself so well as far as trying to avoid having the problems again down the road so i agree a lot of um, my patients who have the sort of disc herniation issue um, and have the sciatica down the leg I tend to have a lot of stress in the sitting position. So if mm. we can improve their sitting posture, their positioning, and, you know, sort of supports, cushioning, that kind of thing, that can actually help um, get them in a, a place where they can tolerate sitting better. Or sometimes we even say, sure. like, you know what, for a week, you just, you're not going to sit for more than 10 minutes. Like it's going to be tough, but it it will help if you temporarily kind of remove that Mm -hmm. aggravating factor. And then most of the time you can um, end up adding those activities back in later. Gotcha. Um, So how about surgery? Do people, will I need it? Um, At what point? I know you said after a while when PT doesn't seem to be working, you refer them on. Is that kind of what leads them down to, possibly needing the surgery that's part of it um you know most people um most physicians won't indicate surgery for, until it's been at least a year okay um because people do get better mm-hmm. um so they're really looking for really chronic symptoms or really really severe symptoms that are just impacting someone's life um 
they usually have tried a lot of other options already. So you don't usually go right away into surgery. Yeah. Um, or if it's some of those sort of like more serious conditions that might indicate needing a surgery <clears throat> um, earlier, like that unstable vertebra or, or issues that are going to cause more damage, um, then they might say, you know, okay, you really need to do this. But mm -hmm. for most people with sciatica, surgery is actually pretty unlikely. Okay. It's kind of a last resort then. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but it wouldn't be my first choice yeah. to have back surgery. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I could imagine the recovery would be pretty intense, too. Yeah. So if you think PT is intense to try to manage the symptoms, imagine what it's like after surgery. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but either um, way, you end up in PT still. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So <laughs> that's a way to look at it. Um, so if if I do need surgery, what are some of the common procedures you see? One of the procedures we'll see commonly is called a microdiscectomy. Okay. Um, and that is just when they go in and they cut off just like a little piece of that disc that's mm -hmm. between the vertebra, a little cushion if, if it's kind of sticking out um, and kind of pushing on the nerve, they'll take that little piece off. Um, that that's a surgery people recover from quite well. Uh, it's it's I don't want to say it's minor surgery because it's back surgery, but it's it's less aggressive, mm -hmm. um, and and people generally do do pretty well with that. Um, they can also do a laminectomy, which is similar, but they're taking out little bones. We talked about how sometimes the bone has gotten too thick, and that's what's pushing on the nerve. So they just take out a little piece of the bone. Um, I think people do fairly well with that as well. Um, the most aggressive surgery that we'll see is a fusion. So a, a permanent connection of, of two of those vertebrae. So instead of kind of moving individually, they're like one piece and they just move together <clears throat> and they're kind of stuck like that. Mm. That's usually for like really serious injuries, fractures, mm -hmm. unstable vertebra. Um, it's not something that most people are going to have recommended um, for their sciatic pain. Um, it's just um, something that we would do to kind of protect the spinal cord um, if there's potential for injury. Okay, gotcha. So moving on uh, to prevention, um, what are some of the ways we, or what are some of the things we can do to help prevent um, getting these conditions? And I'm gonna guess one of them is not lying in bed. <laughs> Generally not lying in bed, though yeah. I'm a fan of a good nap myself. Yeah. Uh, you know, having an active lifestyle is so important for so many different conditions, including mm -hmm. sciatica. And that can mean whatever it means to you. You know, um, the biggest driver of whether or not someone will do an activity is whether or not they like it and enjoy it. So if you like to walk walk and if you like to swim swim and whatever kind of is available to you you know if you're wheelchair bound do you like doing seated exercise classes um just all of us need to move our bodies in some way and try to make it something that's fun for you and not a chore <laughs> um <laughs> right uh some of the other kind of important things that we can do um for sciatica specifically, um, I think one of the biggest things you can do to improve your health uh, now is if you're a smoker is to to quit. And I know it's not that simple or easy, right, right. Um, but there's a lot of resources out there and it makes a huge difference. Um, so smoking contributes to um, disc and bony damage in the spine. Um, and there's also some interesting research on the ways that it can change your um, pain pathways and mm. people might experience actually more pain, um, which is pretty interesting stuff. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Um, then you've got some kind of like population specific stuff. If you're someone that works at a desk, you know, learning about ergonomics, your seating, your positioning, your setup, that can make a big difference. Um, and for people who are going through pregnancy, um, taking really good care of your body. So during pregnancy, 
the hormones kind of make all your ligaments a little bit looser and stuff's mm. moving around more. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be kind of problematic. So there's some kind of products you can use for that to kind of help stabilize the pelvis. Um, and I think for all of us to stand on top of like our core stability, our posture, you don't have to do a crazy ab workout, but um, kind of thinking about like, can I hold myself upright? Can I sit unsupported and hold mm-hmm. myself upright? Um, kind of stabilizing the, the areas around the back um, sure. can really help. Sure. And I just want to add, if people are listening to this today that they are wondering what they can do as far as ergonomics. I just did a podcast a few months ago on it. So check it out. <laughs> um, so are there certain things that I'm doing now that are actually aggravating it? I feel Sometimes. myself naturally wanting to correct myself just as I. <laughs> yeah, we're going to sit up a little straighter yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, staying in any one position too long uh, can be can be difficult and aggravating. Um, you're just sitting on the couch. Like I know when I sit on the couch, I'm like down here, smushed mm. on the couch. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, if you are someone that has to work at a desk all day, that can, can be a challenge. Maybe finding a way to stand up, um, you know, for 10 minutes or five minutes uh, every once in a while, or um, take a walk during lunch break or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the big one that every once in a while we run into is someone who puts their wallet in their back pocket and sits on it for a long period okay. of time. I can see that. Yeah. Cause the nerve runs right, right down there where the pocket is. And so that wallet's just smushing on the nerve. And sometimes you just take, take that kind of behavior away. People get better. They don't need any fancy exercises or uh, machines or anything. Just removing that aggravation can go a long way. Hmm. That's interesting. You know, I, I, I've seen that there's a lot of, uh, like even on Amazon, there's a lot of, uh, ads for those minimalist wallets that are super thin and can fit right in, in your side pocket. So if you feel like you're sitting on your wallet or it might be contributing, it might be time to take a look (laughs) for a different wallet. (laughs) Yeah. So how about, uh, do you have any tips like uh, stretches we can do? things of that nature to kind of help prevent. Yeah, there's you know, there's not one like magic stretch that's going to solve everyone's problems or um prevent every problem, but there are some really common things that we do um with a lot of people mm. and because we see these same patterns a lot, you could try and kind of see <clears throat> if it helps. Um so a lot of people, if they're having symptoms, will feel better with either um, bending forward or bending backward. Usually not both. Um, and you want whichever one makes the pain go closer to the spine, to the nerve root. So I'll prescribe these exercises and I would always tell patients, uh, my hope is that you're going to come back next week and you're going to say, Anna, I hate you. My back hurts. It's terrible. And I'm going to say, how's your leg feel? <sighs> my leg feels great. My leg pain is gone. And I'm like, great. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what I want. Um, and that's part of the process. And then eventually, obviously, we have to get rid of the back pain also. Mm. Uh, but the the nerve, the more irritated it is, the, the further down the leg it shoots. So if we can um, kind of help it go up the leg, that's a plus for us. Uh, so you might find that that doing some forward bending or hugging your legs up to your chest makes it feel better. Um, some kind of gentle like core exercises if you're someone that knows and likes to exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing that's aggravating. I think like the, the the people who maybe feel more comfortable self prescribing core are also more likely to overdo it. Oh, so yeah, that makes sense. Think easy. Yeah. Um, more about control and stability when it when it's flared up, and less about like brute strength. Um, there is a, a stretch that we give a lot of people um, for the muscle that's called piriformis, or you might have heard of a, a figure four stretch. I think it's called a crow position in yoga. 
just kind of like one leg crossed over the other. Um, that can be, can be helpful, but also for some people, it can be aggravating. So you got to kind of see if it's going to, going to work for you. And, um, if you're not sure, you know, always, of course, asking your local PT to help give you some more specific direction. Um, and then kind of your, your standard stuff, your heat for tight muscles, ice for sharp pain or inflammation, um, and behavior change. Removing the stimulus that's causing mm-hmm. the problem. Is it, is it sitting too long? Is it the way you're lifting? Is it, um, you know, uh, maybe standing, uh, sitting on your wallet? <laughs> yeah. Um, trying to change those behaviors that you have control over um, so that, um, you know, the, the nerve is less aggravated. And I would be so happy if, if someone came to me and they said, oh my gosh, like, I need to have PT. I've already tried all these things. I go, ooh, this is going to be a cool case. You yeah, know, <laughs> right. this person's really motivated. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Um, so I guess just wrapping it up, um, do you have any last minute advice to somebody who's listening in and they think they might have, they might have something going on, but they're not sure? I think my, my biggest piece of advice is that it's never bad to ask for help and it's never like too early. You know, you don't have to wait till you've been in pain for two months, three months, six months. You can see someone right away. Um, a lot of times, you know, you know, it makes it actually easier for us to treat, uh, Mm -hmm. if it's an acute problem, the treatment's different. Um, but it can, you know, avoid other issues. Like if your leg really hurts, then you're limping and then you're walking funny and then maybe your shoulder starts to hurt. Uh, it's better to just kind of get the help right away and, Um, it's wonderful if if I see a patient and they get better and they only need three sessions, Mm -hmm. that's great. Um, we're, we're perfectly happy to do that. Um, so, you know, find yourself a a good PT or a physiatrist or, or someone to help you out. You don't have to be in pain. You don't have to suffer. Awesome. Well, Anna, appreciate you joining me today. It's been pretty informative actually um i always when i do these i always find myself learning something new so i think most people tuning in will learn something new today so wonderful thanks for having me yeah appreciate it have a good one all right